so welcome everyone. Um, I think uh, we all know that uh, who is going to speak because of the first slide now. Um, I would really like to thank Gordon Williams uh, for being available for us for the next about how, an, an hour and talk about uh, his, one of his latest projects. Uh, I think from the description that we've sent to everyone, you know that uh, he's been active in four uh, very successful Kickstarter projects. And the last one, the Bangle Jazz, is the one um, that made us really look at what he's doing. And this is the first time actually I saw um, his work uh, through the Bangle JS. And that was, I think, um, it blew me away. I think this is something that uh, is, uh, from an acad academic perspective, I think extremely interesting. And also, this is why I'm going to say now for the next couple of slides a little bit more about what uh, the impact of his work is on us. Uh, I think it's known that he's had a lot of impact on the maker community, people that want to have access to their own smartwatch, for instance, but also their own devices, such as the Puck uh, or the Pico or the Sprino uh, boards that he has been producing. But I think from an academic perspective, it's equally interesting, if not more interesting from us. Um, so we've had here in our research for the last two decades in our group, uh, the goal of uh, capturing data from people, from wearable sensors, and this for a very long time. So, and the idea here is that you usually try to detect what people are doing, what people are up to. So whether they're smoking, for instance, or whether they're doing more complex activities, uh, sleeping, playing tennis, jogging, you know, all of this from very simple sensors that are nowadays in your go-to you know, hardware or go-to uh, devices such as smartphones and also now wearable devices. Now, about 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago, we started making our own hardware just for this. You know, there was no hardware available, and you would have to make your own smart watches because there were no smart watches around. This is around the time that the Pebble, I think, um, came out. But we wanted to do this recording of data 24-7 for several months or even a year. So we had to make our own hardware. And... Uh, from this, I realized quickly how hard this was, you know, making your own microchip based design, uh, making this into a, a prototype that somehow is wearable by people that doesn't break after a few days or a few weeks is really, really hard. And this is a project that's where we spent five years, you know, 90% of the time making things robust and really nice. And of course, certain things worked really well, like, you know, 3D printed cases that were getting really cheap. Um, also, the, the, the screens, for instance, the batteries, all of that um, made us create a lot more than we were supposed to create. You know, we wanted to create about 50 prototypes of this project, and we ended up almost creating a thousand prototypes that were worn by people during various studies. And we also did this in an open source way, so hoping that people would help us. And uh, this was, of course, very, you know, uh, naive of me, of course, we had to do most of the work ourselves. And I, I, through this project, I learned how hard it is to get something started like this and how much effort goes in there. You know, the hardware is very cheap, but uh, doing this really well is really, really hard. And this is something that we've been keeping on doing. And you would think that with the new hardware, the smaller sensors, the better and more digital integration, this would be very easy to do, but it isn't. You know, our newer prototypes have become more powerful, more potent, but at the same time, people have now gotten used to commercial wrist-worn devices and their hopes have been going up as well. So I think that is our problem at the moment, you know, making these things uh, as, a, as a prototype that is durable, that people are like to wear, has become actually harder uh, in the past decade. So with, with, that, with that said, I think the Bangladesh has a perfect answer there for us on how to approach this. And I think Gordon's um, brilliant uh, idea of using, you know, hardware that is already available and repurposing this, I think is, you know, a first step towards exactly this. Now, this is the academic side uh, for the research part. Now, the teaching part is equally important. You know, we try our university students. Um, oops, there's somebody a bit noisy. I'm going to mute them. There we go. Um, so, I'm, uh, the, the, the teaching part is equally important. Also, there it's really hard to convey things like uh, a small screen state or 
very simplistic buttons that you might have on a wearable and how you might then produce software for this. So this is the result of, of the first couple of exercises this uh, term. So we had people create their own watch faces, their own textual inputs. And we've, had, we've seen actually that in just a short amount of time, just a few weeks, people have been managing with the Bangle JS really an enormous amount of applications. And there are many more that I just have space for like about a dozen uh, solutions. Uh, people went really into loads of effort of, you know, how do I type? Some people went into the, uh, I type it via Morse code, you know, and, and very uh, intuitive and also very non-intuitive, but very innovative things we've seen over the past weeks. So also this is, I think, having a large impact. Um, and I think that's something that Gordon should know, but I think this is also, I think, where uh, that light that shows the direction in where we're going. And I think this makes it even more interesting, I think, of what is uh, about to start or what we will see soon um, in Gordon's talk. So without further ado, Gordon, welcome. Normally this would be like a presence uh, talk where you would come over uh, to our university and you know we would have, have, have dinner afterwards. Unfortunately, all of these things are have to be postponed at least. Uh, but I am looking very forward uh, to your talk, and I'll stop sharing now, so you can start sharing already. Um, so thank you for saying uh, yes to giving this talk, and we're all looking forward to it. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. It's um, it's actually really interesting to see um, some of the stuff that's been done, and actually to recognise some of the guys' things that have been posted on the forum. I think. Um, right, I'll just try and share this just a sec. Almost there. Okay, hopefully you guys can see something now. Yep, we can. Yep, all good. Right. Um, yeah, so, so just a sec. Uh, yeah, it, it, the talk's really about um, how I came up with, with one of these devices because. You know, I, um, Esprino, it's an open source project and there's, there's not generally a lot of money in, in open source stuff. Um, it's been bootstrapped and crowdfunded by sales of things like Bangle.js, uh, originally a little board like this, uh, which, which first ran the, the software. Um, so like, yeah, there's no VC funding or anything. I can't afford to kind of get a load of injection molded parts. Um, and so really the, um, it just seems to make a lot of sense to try and use something that's already out there. So I guess first thing is, why would you want a, um, a kind of a hackable smartwatch? Uh, so, I mean, as you've, you've seen like the, the medical side of it. Um, the other thing is you might have some hobby like, uh, like sailing or biking or, or even flying that, um, that you have some very specific requirements for either what information is, um, is recorded or what it's displayed or what it's done. And even if something is available for you, um, it may not be very good or it may be really expensive because it's just kind of um, low volume pretty much. So you can make your own. And actually, I mean, um, the like the prototypes we've just seen are way better than this. But th this is something that some guys made on the internet. And it's, it's a really fun project. It's really nice to do, but the the challenges of trying to make it into something that you can wear every day are huge. Um, you know, just the whole making it strong and waterproof or at least moisture resistant um, is just really, really difficult. It, with 3D printers, you can go a long way, but it's still, um, it's still hard to find something that someone wants to wear. So you could try and go high end, but um, you know, th this is inside an Apple Watch and it's, it's an amazingly, high-tech piece of equipment um now even if it were um if, if it it hadn't been tried to be locked down uh, it would still be really difficult to um to get started on because everything's like tiny packages uh boards with loads of layers um and, and if you make a mistake and accidentally break one then it's it's really expensive so there's got to be kind of a, a middle ground somewhere and it happens that there are a whole bunch of cheap sports watches. Um, so 
they're generally made with technology that's a little bit older than like the cutting edge Apple Watch. Um, and the hardware is, is surprisingly good. It's a lot better than you could really do yourself. They've got really good battery life, but the software is absolutely horrendous on them. So it's kind of ripe for trying to make some changes. Um, so there are a few different options you've got. I mean, if, if you just do a quick search for smartwatches, you get a bunch of stuff. Um, and generally they fall into three categories. If you've got MediaTek based stuff, which is, um, it's the same chipset that you might get on a, on a feature phone. So it's probably got um, GPRS available. So like, like actually a mobile phone, it's got um, GPS, Wi-Fi. It's like a, a nice little device, but it's, it's still quite high end for getting started. There's a lot of stuff to kind of get to grips with. Um, then you've got these things uh, which have very obscure um, chip manufacturers like Hunter Sun. Um, and you probably won't even find any data sheets for the processor. It may not even be something that you like a standard processor, like an arm or something. And then you've got a whole bunch of stuff that's um, uh, got a Nordic NRF52 chip in. Now, these are actually really neat little devices. So um, uh, Nordic Semiconductor, they started off making uh, 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth radios, the kind of things that you get in like a, your, um, your mouse. In fact, I believe Logitech were one of their biggest customers initially. And they kind of, they figured they'd add a processor to it and they, they started kind of building out and they've ended up with NRI 52, which became really quite popular. It's got an ARM core, uh, 64K of RAM, 512K of flash, nothing like huge, but in terms of mic controllers, it's, it's quite reasonable. And the Bluetooth low energy is completely on chip, which makes it, it really nice. Um, so another nice thing is because it's got an ARM controller, pretty much all the ARM Cortex mic controllers use the same debug connector called SWT. Uh, so SWD, it's got ground, and two data pins. And in this one, you can see it's got, um, it's got a fourth pin, which is just the power as well. So you could just power the whole board just with these three pins. So that makes life really easy. So that's fine if you can get into it, um, but you've got a big difficulty in that a lot of these watches aren't even designed to get into. So um, if, especially if you're trying to if you're trying to develop, it's not a big problem because you can just cut it open. But if you're trying to produce these, you've kind of got to have buy-in from the factory because once the factory's closed up the watch, it's very difficult to do anything with it. Now, you would think that that would be a complete showstopper, but actually um, you can update the firmware wirelessly. You, you would think that the uh, watch manufacturer would, they would actually lock it down such that you couldn't update firmware. But what happens is uh, when this NRF52 was released, they went through a whole different, a whole bunch of different SDK versions. Um, and the very first one had kind of a proof of concept firmware update, which had no security checking or anything and a few bugs in it as well. And then soon after they released a new SDK with a secure, um, a secure bootloader and firmware update. And from then on, it was very difficult to, um, to issue a firmware update unless you had a, a private key for it. It turns out that pretty much all the watch manufacturers in China, they got the very first SDK and they just stuck with it. So a good 80% of these watches um, that use this particular chip, the NRF52832, they all have this old bootloader with the problems and no firmware checking. And if you see someone with one of these old watches with the original firmware, you can actually without them being aware of it, you can connect to it, you can completely update the firmware to something different. Um, and, and just with no user interaction from them at all, it's, it's horribly insecure. So um, yeah, luckily it is possible to, um, to take advantage of this. Uh, it requires a few really nasty hacks to, to make it work, but it's something that we actually do for the Bangle J so that I can actually ship them out with the firmware pre-installed. So, I chose this one. There were loads out there, but I really wanted something with a GPS in it because um, it just opens up a lot more possibilities. And that really narrows it down to just a, a handful of watches. 
So this is um, something made by a company called DT Number One, and it's the, the F18. And, and this was their product page for it. So um, it's got the NOF52, it's got a 240 by 240 pixel display, which kind of poses a few problems by itself because the display uses, would it be about over 100K of, of RAM effectively, but the process has only got 64K. So you can't have a full image of what you're writing to the screen in memory, not at, not at full resolution anyway. Uh, it's got GPS, it's got a compass accelerometer, bags of flash memory in an external chip and a heart rate monitor. So this isn't the first watch I've looked at and had to reverse engineer at all. There are loads of them and actually the hardware is really the issue. Um, it's more either finding something with, um, with the issue with the firmware uploaded that allows you to update the firmware wirelessly or getting a, um, a manufacturer that's on board. And because pretty much all these manufacturers are based in China, um, there's a huge language barrier problem. And um, even when I got to the point of hiring someone to, to help translate and negotiate, things still didn't really work out. So um, what's inside these things? Well, in the watch itself, um, you can see like, uh, this is a one I've got for development, but inside you can basically pull out the back and, um, and inside there's this puck. There's the display on top. There's a little brown GPS aerial you can just see at the back. Um, and then there's a flex which goes around to the back where you've got the heart rate monitor, um, the charge port, the buttons on the side and the speaker. And you can just see the battery sandwiched in there as well. If you start peeling all of these things back, you can actually completely um, flatten the whole device. And you can see all the, the different parts of it. You can see the display in silver, the little gold speaker, um, the battery, and then the, the PCB right in the middle. So um, at this point, the whole watch actually still works. Um, you, you can start using it and fiddling with it and um, e even in its kind of exploded state. So um, I guess it's kind of important to to then know actually how circuit boards work when, when you look at this. Um, this, is a, this is a homemade PCB, but um, like not that long ago, circuit boards were, were very similar. Um, it's a bit of a sheet of glass fiber with um, copper tracks, which have been basically etched into it. Um, and the components go through holes and the tracks join them up. So, Things have moved on a little bit. Um, this is a, a development board from, from ST. Um, this is called the two layer board. So you've actually got copper tracks on both sides and you can just about see these tiny little pinholes where they connect one side of the track to the other with, uh, with wires. So um, they've, as time's gone on, um, Things that go through holes are very, very hard to place by machine, which means that they're very costly and also they're very large. So um, like most components now are surface mount, they're just stuck to the surface of the, the board. Now th this type of board is actually still quite easy to work with because um, if you reverse engineering it, you can see there's the, um, the green solder resist layer, but underneath that you can actually see all the wires. And if you just took a photo of one side and then a photo of the other side, you can actually look and see where all the wires go. Um, now, this is an example of the heart rate monitor on, I think it's the one on the bangle. Um, even when there's, they've covered it in black paint, you can effectively still um, sand the board down, take a picture of it, and then, uh, and then kind of draw out where all the connections go. So uh, this is, it's, I mean, what I've done here wasn't, wasn't desperately good, but it's not a very complicated process. There are actually companies that will perform this for you. Uh, how it gets more difficult, as boards get more complicated, you need more connections and you can no longer just route where you want with wires on one side or the other side of the board. And they start putting several layers of copper in between. Uh, and now you, you can't see what's going on because you, you only know what happens at the top and bottom and not what happens in between. And this makes life much more difficult, including this is a picture of a Raspberry Pi, and you can see that the chip in the middle is um, it's something called a ball grid array. 
which means that instead of having the connections around the outside, it's got connections pretty much all in the middle, where there's no way you could actually get to these with the meter and, and see where they go. So for trying to um, reverse engineer something like this watch, um, it's, it's very difficult. And it's a it's sort of the, um, the bangle dress is halfway in between. It's got a four layer board. You can see a bunch of tracks on the top. Uh, you can see where I've taken a picture of each side of the board and you can actually um, trace through and see um, uh, where, where some of the connections go. I don't know if you can actually um, make any out, but you can see the, uh, the debug headers on the right hand side and you can kind of follow the wires down. I've labeled in yellow where those, those pins are. And if you kind of go along to the left, you can roughly see where, where the vias are that, um, that connect them all together. So you can, you can get somewhere with this, but it's, it's not, not easy. Um, so the next step is to, um, to look at the data sheets of all the components to see where the pins go. And you can kind of cross-reference that with, the, um, with what you see on the circuit board a bit to get, to get some ideas. Um, and the nice thing is that all the data sheets for components, um, the vast, vast majority of them, they're completely free, available online. You can pretty much just Google the marking that's on the top of the chip and find them. Be because the chip manufacturer, they want to sell you chips, so they have no interest in hiding the information on how to use them. Um, so the next thing you can do, if you're, you know, you're not gonna be able to get um, proper information about where everything goes, but we've got a, um, a JavaScript interpreter in this case that we're trying to run on it. So we can upload the JavaScript interpreter and run it, and then we can start issuing commands so, um, uh, yeah, so in this case, I've got the exploded Bangle.js with the um, uh, sort of so we can see the hot rate monitor. And you can just issue a command and you can, if you set all the pins to one and the heart rate monitor lights up, then you know that one of those pins is a heart rate monitor. And you can now do a little binary search. You can, you can set half the pins to one. If, if that doesn't work, you set the other half to one and then you, you kind of work within that and you narrow down until you find out the problem. And you, you can do a similar thing with, with buttons as well. Um, so, so for instance, you just read all the pin state, you press a button and you read it again and you see, see what changed. So that gets you a few of the more obvious things done, you know, the vibration motor, probably the screen backlight, the um, any LEDs there might be, the buttons, charge port, things like that. Um, but then we start to hit more problems. And how do you, you might actually need to find out what the original manufacturer has done. So normally these devices, they, the chip includes a, uh, a special uh, sort of a fuse bit that you set. And when that's set, you can no longer read any information out of it. However, you can quite easily clear that bit and everything in the chip. So you won't, you won't be able to um, see what had originally been done, but you can still play with the hardware. Um, now, these guys, they all ship firmware updates. And because the firmware update is not encrypted or, um, or, or checked in any way, uh, you, you can figure out the original firmware file that went in there. So uh, this is an example firmware update for one of them. It's actually a Android APK file. And the APK is a, a zip file, so you just rename it you open it, and then you find that there are a whole bunch of hex files in here. And you can see kind of the, the level we're at with this because um, this hasn't just got one hex file in, it's got a bunch of hex files. There's a hex file called Blinky, which is like you know the name you'd give to the most basic thing that flashes the light on and off. And the other names are the names of examples in the uh, Nordic Semiconductor SDK. So they really haven't gone very far past what they had to do to get something working. So uh, we can open this hex file and we can see what's in it. And yeah, I mean, there's a pattern here, but it's, it's not immediately obvious what it is. Um, however, if you look at the data sheet for the, for the ARM microcontroller, you find that um, the first few, few bits of it, of the, of the binary are actually a vector table. So they contain addresses that point to um, where functions are in the rest of it. So for instance, there's a reset handler and the reset handler gets called as soon as the device starts up. Um, 
uh, the, the cystic handler is a handler that gets called um, every few seconds as an internal counter kind of overflows in the in the microcontroller. And there are lots of other things like that. So um, yeah, as you look into this, you start to see where will these things go. But while you could dig into this manually, it's, um, it's going to be really painful. So there are tools for this. One of these is called Gydra. Um, it's actually developed by the NSA. Um, I assume mainly for finding security holes in, um, in other people's devices. So it actually makes life quite easy. You load the um, firmware file up into it. Um, you tell it what processor it's running on. And as long as it's got files for that processor, it will link in. Um, you can see it's got the, um, the reset handler here and all the other handlers. And it's worked out that they go to functions. And it kind of disassembles that function. So we can kind of um, drill down a bit further. Um, now, you've, you've got this code, but you, you have no idea um, what it's actually doing. However, again, chip data sheet, if you look at it, um, the, the chip has various peripherals. This is the GPIO, which is a general purpose input output. So um, the idea here is that if you want to change the state of a, a physical pin on the outside of the chip, you write data to this particular address in memory and it, it makes things happen. Um, so this is saying that at address 5000508, if you write a number to that, then that will, um, that will turn on the, um, the pin that, that corresponds to that, the bits that are set in that number. So um, there, there are other addresses in there for things like uh, I squared C, SPI, serial, other types of bus that are on the, on the microcontroller. Um, and you know certain things about the type of bus. You know that um, a GPS device will only be using serial. Um, so if something's using the serial device on the, on the watch, then you know that that's probably to do with the GPS. So we can actually do a search through our, our software now. Um, Guidra does disassembly and it also does a decompilation so it can't work exactly it can't work out exactly the code that was written but it can work out some code that um, that is still a lot more human readable than the, the bare assembler so we can um, here we're looking at the um, uh, port 500510 which is what you do when you're you're reading data and you can actually see that it's um, uh, the function on the, the right hand side is it's reading that and then it's shifting it right by a number, adding it by one. So that's actually, uh, it's, it's effectively reading the value of one particular pin. And now we can look back in the code and we can see where code references that. And you know, if, if it's uh, um, uh, checking for the charge port or a, a button pressed or something like that. So, um, do we have any other hints? Well, actually, um, in these firmwares, they, um, they write text on the screen. Um, so for instance, here, it's actually, there's some text stored in the program code that says buy. And I know from using the watch that it says buy just before it turns off. So you can look back, you can see where, um, where the function is that calls that. And then the function that calls that is probably the function that is to do with turning the watch off and shutting everything down. Um, it's like a, a big jigsaw. You can kind of just, you're working in from the edges um, and then you can start to put things together. And it actually ends up being quite a sort of fun problem. So this brings me on to a kind of interesting thing about, um, about the compilers that like, if, if you're writing JavaScript, um, you don't really know what's, what's going on under the hood. You just, you write the code you can kind of poke stuff in and profile it, but you can't see what it's actually going to. Um, with C, you can actually get the code that's created and you can look at that code. And actually it's really handy to see if, if stuff's gone wrong. So um, for instance, uh, the watch itself is designed um, quite, quite cleverly so that the to get the display to run very quickly, they've connected it in parallel to eight pins that are all in line on the um, on the microcontroller. And by writing a byte to a certain address on the microcontroller, you can set all of those at once. So they were really hoping to be able to push data out very quickly. 
and they wrote some code thinking that that's what would happen. And then when it actually compiled, it didn't compile to what they were expecting at all. So you can see here that they, um, they do this, this write to the address, which is very fast. But then in order to do the clock line, it's just ended up calling a function. Um, doing the clock line should have just been a write to another address. But um, it's called this function, which then calls some other stuff. And it makes everything really slow. If they'd been able to look at what the compiler was doing, they would have realized that um, they could have made their watch twice as fast with one change, like basically just changing one line of code. Um, so it, it's a really interesting thing. Like if, if you're developing something, you have a chance to look at this and you, you care about the performance of a certain thing, it's well worth just checking it's actually doing what you expected. Okay, so um, yeah, at the end of it, you end up with something like this, um, just a big table of where everything goes. And hopefully you can, um, you know, you can build out your program and then you can start to um, start to get it using all these features. Especially if you've got an interpreter on there, you can kind of do it without having to go through all the hassle of, of reflashing every time um, and, and checking the, the state of everything. So uh, how do you actually go about getting a JavaScript interpreter onto something like this? Well, you, you would think that maybe you could just use an off the shelf um, engine. So V8 is a good example of an uh, engine that's used basically everywhere. And they have a light mode, which you'd think would make it really uh, efficient. And in a way it does, it's efficient for a phone. Um, but you can see here it's using six megabytes, but we've got only 64 kilobytes in the entire microcontroller. So they've just had to make some very different choices to make everything work. And it just means that it's not really suitable for, for a microcontroller. Um, there are actually quite a few other options now. Um, there, there weren't sort of eight years ago when I started this, um, but even so these options, if you, if you look into them, they say it's 64K for like an absolute minimum. And that's kind of a hello world example. You can't really be doing too much useful in that, but that's like the maximum amount of memory we have available here. So Esprino tries to do things a little bit differently in order to, to make the most of what's going on. So yeah, it's designed to run in very low amounts of memory, um, under 6K of RAM, uh, for instance, on the BBC micro bit, or um, I believe in Germany, you've got the Calliope, which is a very similar sort of thing, which will also run this interpreter. Um, so yeah, it's not all of ECMAScript 5, but it's, it's a reasonable amount, enough that you, um, you wouldn't really know it wasn't the whole thing. I've, I've had to skip out a few things that just, just didn't make sense in a sort of embedded environment. And there's, there's a list of what's, um, what's available there. So the reason for this comes down to this table, really. Um, so if you look at what kind of stuff you've got available um, on a normal PC, you've got it running at maybe two cores, three gigahertz, you know, that number changes a bit, but as a general idea, uh, microcontroller, 64 megahertz. So there's, there's a difference. There's a difference of about a thousand, um, maybe more because obviously the, the CPU on the PC is um, a lot more efficient. But um, the RAM is a very different state. So we've got 64K, right, and, and 512k of ROM. But then if you look at how much effectively read-only memory we've got on the PC, you've probably got 256 gigabytes. It's almost a million times more. So um, if you're actually looking at the amount of processing cycles, it makes sense to spend on a byte of memory. Um, on, a, on a microcontroller, it actually, you've effectively got a thousand times more processing cycles per byte that you could afford to throw at it if you were um, uh, if you were trying to make it kind of as balanced as you wanted to. So, so that means Esprino, it spends a lot more time trying to eke everything it can out of memory than to actually be fast executing stuff. So one of the reasons for this is memory fragmentation. Um, so for instance, uh, here we've got, uh, if you imagine that this is the, the memory you've got available um, and you were trying to allocate little bits of memory, if you want to allocate a whole bunch of separate chunks of memory called BCDEF, you just do them 
you know, you can do the one after the other, that's fine. But then if you deallocate and you don't deallocate exactly the same ones that you reallocated, you end up with holes in your available memory. So like in this example, if we want to allocate something big now, we think we've got 15 memory elements free, but actually we've only got three that we can, we can get in a chunk. Um, so you can do some things like having pointers to the pointers and then shifting them all around, but it all gets very complicated. So um, on Bangladesh and Esprino, we just use fixed size variables, which actually makes quite a lot of sense. Um, so normally if you allocate something malloc, um, you've got at least four bytes, probably eight or maybe even more that are used to store information about that data that's allocated. Um, so you may think that you're, you're being smart by you know, allocating just four bytes on its own to store an integer, but actually it's significantly more than that. So by storing everything in a fixed size chunk, you can, you can be efficient where you, you hopefully can. Um, and in new versions of Esprino, we're looking at really, really squishing this down even further to um, from 16 bytes to, to 13. Um, and so the other nice thing with this is that um, when you have fixed size blocks, you no longer just need to have a pointer to memory. You can now just have an index of that block. So that means that instead of using 32-bit to store a pointer, we're now only storing less than 16. Um, in the case of something like the micro bit, where maybe you're aiming for um, less than a, a thousand memory items in the device, then you're looking at less than 10 bits for your pointer. And that means you can pack things down even further. Um, so another side to this is uh, the, the actual size of code that's on the device. Um, so I took some really simple code that just plotted a Mandelbrot and I tried running it in a few different ways. Um, so normal JavaScript, it was 300 bytes. If I minified that JavaScript, it came to um, 167. And if I then removed all the reserved words and replaced them with a single byte representing that reserved word, which we can do because um, in Esprino, we assume that, and in fact, most of normal JavaScript will only have variable names and things that are in normal ASCII um, codes, which is character code 0 to 127, which leaves you 128 to 255 completely free for something else. So um, yeah, if, if you do that, then you can get it down even further. But if you look at what uh, Mozilla manages when they compile the, uh, the Mandelbrot code down to bytecode, it's barely better than the original code in terms of density, um, as is even GCC compiling it to um, arm thumb machine code, which is supposed to be very compact, um, e even with the flags telling it to produce the most compact code possible. So in a way, if you don't care too much about sort of raw execution speed, the most efficient thing to do in terms of memory is just to store the minified JavaScript code. And, and that's what we try and do mainly on Esprino. So, um, I'll try and give you an example of how this works with the, the fixed size buffer, uh, just a sec. Okay, so um, we have here a sort of Esprino REPL window. Um, and on the right is the, the contents of memory. Um, there are 64 memory items in here. Um, I believe there are, because it's 64, um, it can use a much smaller address. And we're now down to just 11 bytes per, per memory block. Uh, and it's executing everything in here, including the REPL. So if I just start typing, you should hopefully see some, some white appearing. And this, every pixel that you see there is, a, um, is an individual bit, it's not just a byte. And you can see all the, all the character codes going in. And now if I hit enter, it will try and execute that. You'll see it use a little bit of memory and then it'll, it'll finish. And if I do that, that's good. And actually it's not very compacted at the moment. So it's not very fragmented at all at the moment. Um, if we try splitting an array, maybe. So um, let's just write some random stuff um, separated by commas and split it with the comma. Now you could, you could see that as it was building that, it was kind of using up a bun bunch of memories that went down. Um, and actually it displayed it to the console and then it got rid of it. 
So if we, uh, I'm going to have to copy that again. If we then save that to a variable, we'll see that, um, that now there's a whole bunch of information stored for that variable. Um, and you can see how even now, after just issuing a few commands, it, it still gets quite fragmented. And so we're now stuck in a state where we can't actually allocate a, a big chunk of memory if we wanted to. Um, we now need to do this thing with the um, uh, well, with fragmented memory to be able to allocate and make full use of that available memory. So um, yeah, you can. Um, this is 64 um, variables in here. Um, we try and do some things to make the most of them. So uh, if you have an array where um, you're only storing small integers, then um, then it will try and pack sort of the uh, the key index and the, the actual the value into one of those 11 byte memory blocks and some other things to try and make the most of the available memory. But you kind of get the idea of, of what will happen on the actual device. Um, so how do you communicate to it? Well. In the case of the smartwatch, they're actually the only connections on the back of the charging. So your only choice is to use Bluetooth. Um, luckily, there's something really neat called Web Bluetooth now, which um, allows you to connect to Bluetooth devices straight from the web browser. And the, the reason it's actually nice is that there isn't one API that works across all platforms at the moment. Um, so web Bluetooth for JavaScript is, is about the only one that you can, you can really rely on. So um, to make this work, uh, yeah, so it, anyway, this works on a, a bunch of different hardware. Um, and we also try and implement the web Bluetooth API on the JavaScript interpreter itself. So you can, you can use the same code you might have run on the PC and run it on the microcontroller and have stuff happen as well. Um, we use web Bluetooth and end up writing to um, uh, all the tools are generally trying to use it as well. So for instance, the IDE with a syntax highlighted editor, it's got a, a bit of a debugger in there as well. Uh, and everything can just run online. We can kind of keep it all up to date. Um, if you want to load apps onto Bangle.js, that is itself just a website, which is, um, uh, the development version is uh, entirely static and runs on GitHub pages. So you can actually, if you want to add your own apps, you can just fork it, change it however you want. Um, and you've, you've got it kind of hosted and running for you completely for free with very little, little effort at all. And this thing will run on, on pretty much any device. So um, an idea of what an app for it might actually look like. Um, this is a speedometer to just tell you how fast you're going. Um, because it's JavaScript, you're kind of handling uh, running stuff on events a bit more. So um, we've got, uh, uh, we, we turn the GPS on and, um, and then we handle a, a sort of a GPS event that just contains the, um, the current latitude and longitude and speed and stuff like that. Um, and you can see most of the code here is actually just arranging to write it to the console in the right way. Um, so yeah, you've, you've got the emulator as well. Um, because the, this is all kind of web-based um, and also because we're just writing code to a microcontroller, which has quite a small footprint, you can use something called them scripting, which um, allows you to compile C code into JavaScript that you can then run in the web browser. browser. So what you are um, experimenting what you're actually using in the emulator that's online is just a, um, it's a real Bangle.js implementation, exactly the same as would run on the device. It's just, it's just running in a web browser. Um, yeah, and that's about it. The, um, I've done a bit on Bangle.js here, but there are a whole bunch of other different devices that, um, that it runs on. These are boards that, um, that effectively uh, official boards that when they get sold, they kind of help to fund my and other people's work on Esprino. But um, you can actually run it on a whole bunch of other devices. It's been ported to ESP86, ESP32, um, uh, the micro bits, uh, and yeah, a 
whole bunch of other devices and hopefully more as time goes on. Um, talking of which, it's also available for, for other types of smartwatch as well because it's open and people can just port it and make it work how they want to. And yeah, that's it. If, I mean, if anyone has any questions, I am more than happy to, um, to, to try and answer. Very nice. Thank you, Gordon. It's okay. I'm sure there are questions. Um, so if you have questions, you can either ask them via the chat or just ask them by unmuting yourself and then asking. I have a short question. Um, yeah. If you go for JavaScript, um, because I guess C or C++ would be more efficient than using JavaScript. Yeah, um, and th there are things out there. That the issue is really that um, that microcontrollers they they can be a bit unfriendly. Um, so, for instance, if if you write a bit of code to flash a light on and off, um, and you upload it to this and it doesn't work, um, it's very difficult to know to know why. Um, so generally, to make to actually debug C code, you need to have a um, uh, like a separate debugger. So, for instance, to when I'm trying to make Bangle.js work, I have have one of these that's then attached to the Bangle.js, and and this is the thing that actually lets me look at the C code and see what's going on. So, uh, having a language interpreter really really helps with um, with just making it easy to develop. And if you want to program in C, there are already loads of things out there. I'm not saying it's like you should always use JavaScript, but um, you know, there's the Arduino IDE uses it, um, and they're pretty much every manufacturer has their own tool chain as well. But if you try doing both, JavaScript is a lot more friendly. Um, if if you make a mistake when you're doing something, which you you ev everyone makes mistakes when they're writing code, um, so. And there are C interpreters, but they are kind of, um, they're not exactly C. Um, and that, that always kind of annoys me when, um, when you're, you're trying to do something and, and you, it should work. You've written the code that would work on any other platform and then it, it doesn't work on a device because there's some, something a little bit special about the implementation. So I, I really just wanted something that looked like C kind of from a, you know, if you just stand back and, and look at the code without looking too closely, it's the same kind of formatting and the same kind of structure, but that was something that was actually designed to be interpreted. Um, so that's that's why I didn't go for something like Python in the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Carrie, you have a question? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. And um, are you still looking for a person to help you with translation? <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding, yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I really like uh, the idea of the PackJS because uh, um, I, I'm not coming from electrical engineer background. So my background is in XCI, but I have this course in microcontroller this semester. And then we understand that actually power consumption and power efficiency is very important in the microcontroller. And I'm just wondering, like, um, if I try to program in PuckJS, um, what should I take into consideration in terms of power efficiency? Because we know that executing JavaScript can, uh, yeah, um, take a lot of energy. Yeah. 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 So it's it's more about um, trying to keep. The, uh, the amount of times you execute, execute code to a minimum. So for instance, uh, if you are trying to detect movement, um, it makes a lot more sense to, uh, to try and configure the accelerometer to wake your code up when something happens than it does to keep asking the accelerometer for information and then try and decide yourself. Um, so definitely if, if there are ways of just um, just reducing the amount of wake ups you do. But it, uh, the really crazy thing is that um, when the microcontroller is running flat out doing work, it's using only about four milliamps. Um, when it's trying to receive Bluetooth information, it uses 12. So like you don't, you don't wanna be receiving 
Bluetooth very much. If you turn on an LED, that will draw like six milliamps. So it, even really silly things like, you know, if, if you're, um, if you're waking up every minute to do a temperature calculation uh, or, or look at some detail and save it away. Um, and when you do that, you decide to flash the LED for a second. Flashing that light is by far the biggest power draw that, um, that there will be in, in what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, but really it's about trying to keep your, um, keep the wake ups as low as possible. And just, you know, if, if you know something is turned on, just, just try and turn it off when you when you don't need it. But, yeah, yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, Big Gordon, uh, thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, this is very very interesting for me from different perspectives. Uh, but uh, as I'm researching in photoplasmography, so. Uh, the heart rate measurement. Um, we, we have a uh, few of your devices uh, at hand. So uh, we already had a look at the signals. And um, well, uh, did you have any specific application in mind when you designed these devices or when you had this development? Or uh, was it rather like a general solution for perfectly everything? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, it was, uh, so I was trying to think of uh, use cases where um, where it, it might make sense for it to function kind of on its own, because I kind of figured that if you were having something you could tether to a watch, um, you already had like a, a, a wrist mounted heart rate monitor or, or some things like that. Um, so the GPS made a lot of sense from that point of view. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a way, I, I wish I had been um, a little bit more careful about the um, the heart rate monitor choice because I I know it's it's really bad if you're if you're moving around and I'm like so when I'm looking at at, at another one for the future. Normal. <laughs> Sorry, that's absolutely normal. <laughs> moving us uh, absolutely away here. <laughs> Although, like, um, so I've, I'm sure you've probably noticed with this, but because it's an analog sensor, um, it's got a, a sort of uh, a sort of a, a calibration built into it, effectively, um, and it means that if you if you move, then that will knock the calibration out for a few more seconds than if you had something digital, where you might have actually been able to um, to filter it out with with an algorithm. But yeah, um, so. Yeah, it, it actually that, that particular choice was more as I kind of hinted at earlier. Um, I I had developed Bangle Jess on a completely different watch. I don't think I've got one handy, but um, it was uh, yeah. Uh, we went to order a bunch of them. Like I went to order about five hundred, I think, for for no comp, and they just turned around and said, "No, we're we're not making them anymore. Sorry." Um, and so I had to very quickly move to another one. And the choices of watch I had that had GPS on were extremely limited. Um, so I, I know this one is is far from perfect, but it's a, you know, it's a, um, it was a kind of a choice of necessity. And hopefully it provides enough stuff that it's still a, a really useful hackable device. Well, it definitely, uh, definitely does. Uh, so uh, to, to also tell you my experience, uh, I think the PPG center has improved a lot in the, in the last years. So uh, I think when you started developing these devices, the PPG centers were in general much worse than they are today. So uh, maybe the next generation will have another center and uh, you, will, you will see a huge difference there. I'm, I'm definitely sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, but yeah, if, if you are using Bangladesh with the PPG and you have any ideas for how to make it better, I'm, I'm super happy to like um, to try and implement them. <laughs> I think we're on that, in fact. I mean, because the, the heart rate monitor isn't that bad. I mean, I think all of them are really bad. There are a couple of really good ones, like the Apple Watch, of course, uh, but it's mostly the mechanical design or the lens design that really makes them good. 
I think um, I think we can definitely work with with those sensors for sure. But I think what you just uh, replied to actually brings me to my question is um, how quickly can you redo this again? You know, say that there's another company that uh, brings out a very similar uh, thing. I mean, it, it is a bit like a box of chocolates. You will get uh, um, a bunch of things, a bunch of modules that you don't really have choice, uh, the choice yeah. of. You know, if you say, I want GPS for sure, then you have to probably cut a few corners elsewhere. Um, so, but, but, but the, the, the question was really, how quickly can you do this turnaround uh, cycle? Say you have a, a, mm. a, a, a watch, you basically try to reverse engineer, see what is in there. Um, probably there's quite a few similarities to what you've already seen. I suppose yeah. there's a lot of copying or best practice going around. Mm. Uh, but, but what is the time frame more or less that you okay. could do? Yeah, so um, it, it's quite interesting actually because uh, I, I didn't cover it in the talk at all, but the um, there seems to be this sort of ecosystem in, in China of these, these smartwatches. And what happens is um, someone will go and they'll be like, I want to make a watch. Um, and they will actually, they will buy a circuit board with the software and the phone app off someone else pretty much and put it in. So you find that a lot of the watches have circuit boards that are all made by the same company, even if they're from different manufacturers. Um, and and you, you, you tend to notice like, I don't know whether it's engineers or a, a company or like they have their own ways of doing things. So y you'll know if you get one that was made by the same person who made one of the other ones, even without seeing a name on it. Um, so a good example of this is actually, um, annoyingly, I can't show it to you yet because um, it's kind of under NDA, but um, so a company saw Bangle.js, and um, they were developing their own watch, um, but they couldn't get, um, uh, that th they were using one of these watch manufacturers that makes a Chinese smartwatch. Um, and they were having a lot of trouble trying to convince them to make the software the way they wanted. Um, they wanted it to look a very certain way. So they got in touch and I was like, okay, yeah, if, if you give me the schematics and stuff, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try and pour their spring on it and we'll see what we can do. Um, it turns out that actually um, they didn't have any schematics. So they were given this watch that was supposed to be custom for them, but they didn't know how it was meant to work. Um, so I ended up having to do it from scratch and I've just finished billing them for, uh, what would it be? It's about two weeks work. And within two weeks, we'd got it running Esprino with like their custom graphics on. So it's one of those things, it gets faster each time because you, as you say, there's a lot in, in common um, be between all the different things, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's nowhere near as long as you would think now, um, especially as, uh, they tend to reuse the same sensors as well. Um, so often, um, yeah, they, they'll be the same accelerometer made by the same manufacturer or the same magnetometer. Um, and so you, you can pretty much, you can find a watch now and, and chances are that at least one of the sensors will already be implemented in Esprino. So once you're in there and you can, you can start playing around with it and, and get things working quite easily. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And it also shows that, you know, there's, I mean, this, this ecosystem, I think, concept is indeed, you know, what is happening um, in China or in the East at the moment. Mm. And it's really interesting how you can jump, jump on that and piggyback on top of this. Um, yeah, absolutely. To, to create something that is, you know, of, of massive value. I think this is yeah. a really, really good example. I think just as in a wider way, actually, um, you find looking at other people's hardware that, um, if you decide you're going to use a sensor, as an engineer, what you do, you, you look at the data sheet and there's an example circuit and you pretty much, you just copy and paste that example circuit and paste it into your project. Um, and that happens all over the place, not, not just in watches. Um, so a, a lot of these sensors now are, are so simple that they're like four pins. You've got power ground and two pins for I squared C communication and that's it. But um, in so many cases, you you can get a really good hint of what's been done under the hood um just by yeah by looking at the data sheets for all these these separate chips yes very nice uh, the two weeks that you mentioned is it day and night or is it really <laughs> a normal working day uh no that that was um well so it um 
it was two weeks in total worth of work, but it was like um, well, spread over a long about, about seventy five hours. So yeah, okay. like oh, wow. like two normal working weeks. Of, oh wow, um, yeah, that is very efficient indeed. Yeah. And maybe one last question to follow up on this. I mean, um, you're doing a lot by yourself, of course. So, um, uh, and you've learned by yourself also how to do this. You know, is there any way uh, a novice could do this uh, as well? And how long would they take to pick it up? I, I think so. Um, I mean, I, I don't really know. Um, it, like, so I learned how to use Guidra using, I think, just some random tutorials that I'd, I'd Googled. Um, and actually the idea of using it came from someone on the Esprino forums who has done some other work who is just a, an enthusiast. Um, and there's a guy, oh now can I remember the name? Aaron Christopher maybe? Um, if you look him up on YouTube, he does a whole load of reverse engineering and not running JavaScript, but um, mainly trying to get the Arduino IDE um, producing code for these custom watches. So for instance, Pine Time, which is the other obvious open source one. Um, I think he's, he's done some work on that. Um, yeah, and they're, they're all kind of in, enthusiasts. Uh, so it's, it, it's not to say that you can't do it at all. And I think um, it, it's, it's actually, it's the reverse engineering itself is quite a fun thing to do. Um, like yeah, what you you know you can just kind of dig away at it and you you just peel off a little bit more and then you're like ah oh, so that's how that bit works. Um, so yeah, I would I would hugely encourage it. Uh, maybe even just starting off writing something yourself and then having a look at reverse engineering that um, as a as a way to to start off with it. But yeah, I, I could could definitely encourage that. Perfect. I might give it a try myself. I haven't reverse engineered <laughs> anything since the Furby, in fact, which is about 20 years ago. I think. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you. There's a question on the chat. Um, somebody saying uh, or asking, um, what are your thoughts on security and privacy with relation to uh, web Bluetooth or web BLE? Um, yeah, so there's, I feel like there's a lot of, um, uh, th there's a lot of distrust of it. So Apple, refuse to implement it on their devices and the reason they use is security. Um, same for Mozilla. Um, but it's actually um, it, like they knew when they were doing this that it was going to be a, a big problem. Um, so that they've, they've really tried to think about the security things. There are, there are certain things like the device firmware update that I mentioned that is, is really insecure that they block in the web browser. So you just cannot do it from the web browser. You've, you have to click through um, to, to enable uh, support. And to be honest, if you are clicking checkboxes that appear from the operating system, um, you're only one click away from installing some malicious binary on your device anyway. So it, it's, it's really no worse than that. Um, I, I feel like you know, that, that's the side of it. They, they, they do try and protect you. If there's something they know is a problem, then they can block that very quickly in the browser, but um, yeah, so far it's been in Chrome for five years, maybe. Um, and, and we haven't heard anything bad about it. There have been no examples of it being abused at all. So I, I don't think um, it's anything necessarily to worry about too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's in any Chromium based browser. So I think it's, yeah. it's, it's not like you just have to, you're bound to this one particular browser and you can't do anything else. I think it's- No, it's Chrome, Chromium, Opera, um, Edge now. So, so Edge is nice because it's basically installed by default on, on all the Windows PCs anyway. So yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other thank questions? You. Any other last question perhaps? Because we're, we're slowly going over the hour now. Doesn't seem to be, no. Okay, then Gordon, thank you very much once more. It was really enlightening. I think everybody enjoyed it a lot. Um, and yeah, uh, all the best to you. I think we will keep on contacting you uh, for our, <laughs> our bangles. Uh, you will see our code appearing as well, not just on the forums, but also elsewhere, I think, uh, soon. But yeah, thank yeah, you very much. I, I look forward to it and thanks for inviting me. It's good. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, cheers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.